one more back before I pass it back to you, Ali. <laughs> hey guys, we'll just jump right in. Um, thanks so much for taking the time. I know everybody's pressed for time just to have you take the time to talk with us and talk to our guys. I really, really appreciate it. I think I just want to sort of start at the start to start, sort of walk through your careers a little bit, what you've learned, mistakes you've made, successes you've had. Um, John, I know you, you, know, you grew up in Englewood. Dr. Griffin, I don't, I don't know where you grew up, you can talk about that, but talk to me about John growing up in Englewood during that time, what that was like. So Englewood was um, much uh, like it was. It was very um, close for me, knit, but it was, it was gangs and uh, crack cocaine uh, was entering in the scene. I grew up in Englewood, moved in there in 1974, and I left in 95. So gangs, dropout, uh, the legacy of unemployment, underemployment, um, gang affiliations. But I played basketball like you did, Mr. Secretary. So the gangs kind of left me alone. And uh, growing up, we still had on our block, it was very close-knit in terms of family. We took care of each other, worked out for each other. Um, a lot of my colleagues at that time didn't make it out either in prison or uh, end up in, you know, uh, killed or a lot of, a lot of death. So, uh, but we were determined to do, my mom, single mother, uh, we were determined to uh, make the best of a situation. My wife grew up in Washington Heights. No, so I grew up in the West Pullman area, which okay. is west of Roseland. Um, back then we used to call it Maple Park because mm -hmm. it was a small segment there. Um, and similar to John, um, although we weren't gang infested because there are, um, it's very residential in that community. Um, I was on the outskirts on 119th where my single mom, uh, uh, four, four, four children, it was it's four of us, um, you know, grew up in an apartment. And so basically what we were familiar with in the community was our home, our church and the school. Right. So we went to the local neighborhood school, Whistler Elementary. All of us went there, graduated from there. Um, and then during that time, that is when what was relatively new was high schools, elementary schools were feeder schools into high schools. And so back then, um, in the 80s, we were earmarked, all of our students were earmarked to go to Finger. So although I was a very high performing um, student in elementary school, because of my residence, I went directly to Finger High School. And so there, because it's east of where I grew up, I was kind of, the gangs were a little bit, little bit more upfront and close to me. Right. Um, there were, you know, the, the shootings, um, the groups of kids that had a little bit less limited exposure to different things. And so it was um, a cultural difference, but many of the dynamics that we shared was single family homes, yep. um, you know, access to church, access to school was really our world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. You talked a little bit about basketball that for so many of us was the way out, but that, you know, it's not, that's no guarantee. You're still growing up seeing people get locked up. You're still growing up seeing people shot and die. Talk to me about just sort of dealing with that trauma. What's that like to, to face that? What's that like to be part of your world? And what it kept is, you on the straight and narrow? It is, um, I'm telling you, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Arnie, Arnie, no Mr. Secretary stuff. Oh, <laughs> well, I just saw you on MSNBC, so I was like, oh, Mr. Secretary, yeah. <laughs> I jump off and have to do this. I'd rather do this, so. Yeah, this um, um, that was uh, very traumatic for a young man, um, you know, a young black male to see colleagues, um, you know, people we played ball with, uh, got into the drug game because we all were, you know, single parent households and we were trying to find a way out. I was just a little afraid of my mom, <laughs> you know? So my mom uh, told us, listen, you know, this is where you're, she worked two jobs. And she put us in St. Basil's and then later on I went to Leo High School and then later on Harper, I graduated from Harper High School. So my mom worked very hard and to see her work so hard and so diligent, I just didn't want to disappoint her as, as, as you know, she's my mom. So I worked hard in school. I wasn't smart as she was, she's, she's smart. She's a brains in operation, you know, but, um, to see uh, black men shot down, we would go to Sherman Park. I grew up in Winchester, 55th. 
when we walked to Sherman Park, we played basketball. And to see shootouts happen where guys got shot and, and some of the, uh, the guys I played ball with, even in uh, Leo High School, um, uh, St. Basil's Elementary School, to see these guys uh, later on get hooked on drugs, you know, a lot of that happened. Uh, to die early in gunfight, it was very impactful. It was, and we didn't understand that it's actually uh, post-traumatic. We didn't, I, I didn't know, I didn't understand the term, but as I grew as a man, that still stayed with me, you know? So it was just, uh, that was our world, unfortunately. So we had to, you know, but blessingly I had uncles and my grandfather and they were around me and they helped guide me and, and made sure. Uh, my first um, example of a man was my granddad. And then my uncle, uh, Freddie, went to DePaul University and I followed him into DePaul University. So those are my examples. Yeah. Doctor? And so for me, we really got our solace from the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the church was part of our community um, and the church did more than just fellowship on Sundays. And so from there, that's where I got my reference of college education, um, having the ability to go on college, pay college tours, just having that access to the world that was beyond my home, my church and my school, you know, really is what helped open my mind to see what was possible. And then the representation that we had on TV was also limited. And I know we talk often about the Cosby show being a right. great point of reference, but that came in my later years. That came during my later high school years. Yeah. So growing up, my point of reference of what was considered successful was the Brady Bunch. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of saw a synopsis <laughs> of what family was yeah. um, and what success would look like. And then came, uh, the Cosby, the Cosby show yeah. to make it a little bit more real for me. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. So for our young men watching who, like you, you know, most don't have, you know, didn't grow up with dads around all the time, um, but may not be blessed with the strong moms that you had. And both of you talked about church and may be disconnected from church and uh, right. don't, don't have those supports. What's your advice to them? Um, your road was hard. You've done amazing, but their road candidly often is harder now. How do you think about that? The choices you would have made or the choices you asked them to think about now, absent a super strong mom, absent a, a church that's much more than a place just to go on Sunday mornings. You know, uh, Arnie, I, that's, you, you're very accurate and that the role these young brothers travel now is much harder because as a young black male in society, you know, we still could make a little mistakes and then be okay. You know, either you, you make a mistake left or right, the gangs will get you or the cops will get you. But now you have to be straight and narrow. And it's very difficult because you're adolescent. You do things that, you know, you do stupid stuff. You're impulsive. Um, my advice to these people, these young, these young brothers from our community is you have to understand. The way I identified the way I made it is I had to understand that the roles that led to the drug dealers or led to um, taking drugs or doing that, what was the outcome? And that was, for me, it's, that was more impactful to me to actually see people, saw my uncles uh, do, male, do drugs and see what happened to them and alcoholism. And so I had a choice. Do I follow that path or do I seek out people like Arnie Duncan or John Venetia Griffin? Because in our world, in AGB, we offer more than just a job. And each and I believe that you can't offer anyone anything unless you give full water shelter or the ability to get full water shelter. So not only do we employ you and give you life skills, but we teach you how to groom. We teach you how, because we became more than just uh, an employer. We became counselors. We became fathers. We became mothers. And we understand our responsibility. And that is why we are the largest black owned security company in the nation, because we believe this is a ministry. So to those young brothers and those young sisters who are looking, we are the solution, AGB. Yeah, I'm, I, I can't uh, kind of sum it up any better than that. Um, the work that we do at AGB is in our name. AGB mm -hmm. means always giving back. And this isn't a trend that has just started That's as right. a result of the civil unrest. AGB has been in business in 19 years. 
And so this is our way of life and this is the way we do business because as a result of John and my upbringing, uh, we know the significance of high quality programming. We know the significance of um, access. And it's not that our young people can't do it, Many times they just don't have the access or opportunity to do it. And so although we understand that we employ, um, you know, individuals, uh, it's so much more to that, uh, helping aid them, their families and their children. Exactly, exactly. And I, I wanna get to the business in a minute, but I wanna sort of continue the, the trajectory through your lives. So talk to me sort of post high school, what were you guys steps after that? She has a long list, you know. <laughs> she worked for you, actually. She worked in PBS. Yes, she has right. a long list. Yes, yes. <laughs> so after high school, I um, uh, went to DePaul University. I got my degree in business, my master's in public policy. Uh, but that road, Arnie, was not just as smooth. I got into DePaul University. I got into uh, fraternities. Never drank the smoke, just kicked it. I kicked out DePaul University for four years. I uh, had a 1.9 GPA. You see my transcript, it says start over. <laughs> you know? That's what it so um, I kicked out, uh, I met my wife, and uh, she was, we was college sweethearts. She was at Loyola University, met my wife. Um, we became pregnant as a young man. I was, uh, well, I wasn't pregnant, but she was, <laughs> <laughs> let's just get that, you know. Um, um, grew up, I grew up, you know, I had to get back in school. So I, I worked two jobs. I worked in the mail room, and I was a waiter. Paid my tuition back to DePaul, got readmitted to DePaul University on probation. 1.9 GPA, worked my butt off, got all A's and B's, graduated, uh, went to the sheriff's department, went to the state studies office, uh, went and got my master's degree, and then moved on to uh, be detailed to the Secret Service. Uh, all the while, raising our family, my wife and I raising our children, and going to uh, build my business at night. Yeah. yeah. Now, now this is this this is a long list. So, I have a long <laughs> list. Um, so yes, after high school, went to Loyola University scholarship um, and was awarded <laughs> because of my situation and my um, academic uh, capacity. I, I went for a very affordable rate, um, and then after Loyola University, um, I worked at Northern Trust Bank for a short period of time, and then. Um, got my master's in early childhood education, became a national board certified teacher for Chicago Public Schools. Uh, was then at that time recruited by Barbara Issa Watkins to come downtown and ran your program, Aim High. And so, um, and actually credit um, that experience for yes. being able to be as successful as I am in my current role as president of AGB Investigative Services. Yes. And so spent time at the network, spent time um, as an assistant principal. And because the business was growing at a rapid rate, I had to come and insert my skill set here in my own business uh, full time. A couple, couple, couple follow up questions on that. So, John, what didn't work for you college the first time? Uh, maturity. Um, I didn't have a discipline. Um, and I didn't have a, a person in front of me. I said my uncle, I followed him to Nepal, but he left. You know, he left when he did his life. And I'm left. I had no one in my family that I can, um, you know, look at. Denitra and I are, are the vanguards, like most of these young men we're talking to, of everything. The first to get a house, first to get a college degree, first to graduate, first to uh, buy a home. So we're first in everything. So we're first to start a business. So everything we've learned, we've learned uh, by you know knocking our head against the wall and learning because unfortunately in, in the black community, there's a lot, a lot of mentors that can give us these things within our families, you know? So when we set up AGB, we made sure we set our business up as not just employing people, but also as mentors to these people in, in many different facets. And, and then just to follow up, you didn't just persevere, struggle a little bit, got put out, came back, did it the hard way, finished. You didn't just finish, you went on to get your master's. Yeah. Dr. Griffin, you know, got a PhD, 
coming people on the call may not know, becoming a nationally board certified teacher is sort of one of the hardest and most prestigious things that teachers can do in the country. Is a tiny percent of teachers achieve that NBC uh, status. So for both of you individually, why was it important not just to do a little bit better, a little bit more maybe than others in your family, but to continue your educations, to keep learning, to keep growing? Why was that so important to you? So, so for us, because we recognize for ourselves and selfishly for our, for our family, um, it's important that we learn to teach. Yep. And so that has really been our motto. Um, that's just the way, you know, we grow. It's what we don't know. We're eager to learn, mm -hmm. to know, so that we can continue to serve and, and give others. So not does it just, you know, um, it's edifying for us to continue to grow. And we're also parents of four adult children. Yeah. So, so, we, so kids, we have yeah. to teach and be a model and that blueprint that was absent in our life for our children, but also to, to constantly encourage individuals that because of how you start isn't necessarily how you end up. Absolutely. And not now doesn't mean not ever. And so we believe that we will never be dream crushers, but we really have to help help individuals as well as the community to understand whatever you seek out to do, it is possible. The resources is important that we help you find resources and access so that you can be successful. That's right. That's right. And, and John, growing up, it didn't sound with your father, you know, I'm not sure he was not present at all or not present much for you to be a strong present father for all of your children. Again, you were a young, young dad, whether you were ready or not ready, who knows? But why was that so important to you and your definition of your own manhood for you to try and do something a little different, a little bit different than what you had growing up? Denitra mentioned the Brady Bunch, right? You know, as her mother. And when I was a little kid, I went to uh, Fun Town, Fun Town, Fun Town for the kids in you, 95th Stony Avenue. And we would go, and as a little boy, I would see. Uh, my counterparts, you know, white men with their children, and they were able to do so much for their kids. Like, you want a popcorn? You want this? And they were able to do this. And we had to share as children, because it's my mom, and not a lot of money. And I looked at that, and I said, wow, one day I want to do that for my family. I want to do that for my children. Historically, traditionally, Black people have a very spirit, strong spiritual background. And we pass that on to our children, which is great but we don't pass down wealth or the ability to pass down wealth for our children. We do know today that almost 65 to 70% of wealth is inherited. So in order to get wealth for my children, for they, if I can change the trajectory of my family, I had to go to school, I had to learn, and I asked um, uh, myself, who would go for us? And I said, I will. Because I want to be that dad that not only, she said I spoil our kids to death. I don't spoil them, but I want to be able to provide them, be a provider. So I knew I had to go to school, become educated, to create opportunities for myself in my law enforcement career or my business career. And um, I did that. I did it because it wasn't for me. But when I went home, I looked at those, those four kids, and I knew paying for college tuition, make sure my boys uh, see as ever been a man. Make sure my girls understand how to be loved and taken care of. I knew that it was a couple of me to make sure I create. And that's why I started. And then as we became more knowledgeable, we knew we had to go beyond us. Yeah. And this is why we situated in the community. Yeah. So, so much, I'll, just as you, you say stuff or answer, it gives me more questions. But what you said is really, really deep about the goal is to create wealth. Yes. yes. And I think everybody wants some security, needs security. You particularly want it needed if you've never had it. And I think people don't understand always the difference between sort of fast cash, which doesn't produce wealth and comes and goes pretty quick, or long-term wealth creation. Correct. And the two most important things you can do to create wealth long-term, you guys did, is getting a college degree and it's owning your own home. We talked about college, but you also mentioned owning your own home. That's right. Tell me what that was like. At what point did you decide, let's stop renting, let's buy a home, let's make that investment in ourselves and our family for the long haul? What was, it, what was that like? How old were you guys? 
How were you able to do that? You were in our 20s. Right? Yeah, we were in our 20s um, when we knew that we needed a home to raise our children. And we knew that that was the kind of the, the baseline of being able to create wealth. Love, that's right. And so it was, again, to give our kids that, that, that opportunity to see what it is to live and, and be in a home. And selfishly for us, because I grew up in an apartment and he grew up in a multi-level unit with his family, you know, intergenerational family yeah. unit. Grandfather, uncles, yeah. Right. And so uh, we, we knew we wanted that for ourselves, for our own family to be a model for our kids, um, as well as begin to create wealth. And so we also knew um, as a wealth building strategy, we started investing into real estate. Mm -hmm. And so investment property was our next um, angle or strategic initiative that we took in order to begin to create wealth. Uh, we knew that our kids were growing up quickly and we knew that, oh, they need something to be able to help pay for college education. Right. And then, so at the same time of using that as a platform is when the business created because the other facet of generating wealth for family is entrepreneurship. That's right. And so That's right. Uh, we knew that we needed to own something and not necessarily pass the business down to the next generation, but pass the financial wealth down. And I want to just take a minute and explain, just to be real clear, why is home ownership, why does that create wealth, and why does renting not create wealth? What's oh, the difference? Yeah, so, so, so renting is very simply renting. You are you're not building any equity. Equity is the value of your home. You're not building any equity because the more you pay down your loan, and a property appreciates, it means you get greater in value. So we know that that difference between what you owe and what you, you know, invested, that money can be taken and invested in other things. That's how we got our other property. Um, when you're renting, you are actually uh, making the other person rich. You know, you're not having any equity. It's not going towards your credit. You're not building any type of wealth. Uh, so it's going out the door. So we, we knew that, uh, Less, that's the foundation of wealth, home ownership. And as you know, because you was in the Obama administration, that uh, black wealth decreased by 50% during the, the great 2008 because our wealth was tied into our homes. So uh, we knew that, and it was a rough time. But we understood that it rebounded, it got better. So you want to buy appreciable properties, uh, excuse me, not property, but appreciable assets, things that make you money, things that's going to help you live and Arnie I can tell you that uh, you can have anything you want uh, in terms of doing it the right way in terms of ownership in terms of entrepreneurship you got flashy cars you got a jury you can do whatever you want but you got to be passed these on to your next generation and that's what we believe in and that's our philosophy and from that our children are all givers and all entrepreneur like so you know, it's so it's so important and you, you get you get a fancy car that depreciates. Every day you have that car, it's becoming less and less value. That's if right. You own a, if you own a home over time, not overnight, that, that appreciates. That goes up. Right. And as you said, we went through a tough time with the economy. You have to be willing to weather those storms, but over not two months, but over you know, 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years. That's how you build family wealth. That's right. So. Yeah. Stock so market we, too. Stock um, market. And so we, yeah, the stock market as well. Yeah, and so market. we actually, my son, um, as soon as he graduated from college, you know, and you secure your your job where you think you make a significant amount of money, um, just from the example we set, instead of buying that flashy car, which is when he realized he had saved up over time, this choice was to buy a home. That's right. You and I think if we just continue to convey um, the importance of ownership within our community, that the concept will be adopted and received better. We also share, because we have our foundation and we have interns that come in every summer and spend six weeks with us. And we also share with them, at the age of 18, you can actually open every uh, IRA account. So you can begin saving and start investing in wealth building strategies once you become 18. Start your retirement account because by the time you get of age and you want to retire, there won't be pensions. So you need to self-invest. And our young people nowadays are so interested in selling stock and buying stock. So that's, that's the fad now. 
That's good. So let's do it That's smart good. and invest in an IRA or some form of a retirement account at the age of 18. So let's jump ahead. If we were to survey our guys right now on the Zoom call, 95% would say, I want to own my own business. I don't want to work for anybody. I want to do my own thing. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually start a business. And it's a very different thing to have a business that actually succeeds. And the vast majority of businesses, unfortunately, go out of business very quickly. So walk me through just detailed, granular, where you starting from thinking you wanted to own your own business to how did you actually open and start your own business? What work did you have to do to, to live that dream? So the first thing you need is grit. That's the first thing, uh, grit. Because all the naysayers are going to come out. All the barrels of, and the crab in the barrel is going to come out and going to tell you, you got to tune all that. So first of all, be an idea. And for me, um, I, was, I always tell a joke, Arnie. I, I would come home with my paycheck, and I look at my four kids, and I say, Something, something's got to happen. This ain't going to work. <laughs> I got to get these kids through college, so I don't know what to do. So I told my wife, I said, oh, I think I'm going to start a business. I'm a, you know, I'm a law enforcement. I'm going to start a security company. She said, oh, that's cute. That's real cute. You know, I said, oh, I'm going to start a security company. And I'm because I, you know, I moonlighted as, as a, a police officer. I moonlighted, you know, make extra money. I said, I can do this. I can start a company and, you know, make an extra hundred grand a year to help my children buy more property. I had no idea that we'd be north of 750 people, licensed in 14 states, uh, a multi million dollar facility on the southwest side of Chicago, which is built. I had no idea, Arnie, but I'm telling you, you got to have grit. You gotta have faith, you gotta have prayer. So I started with in the basement of my home. And my wife actually painted the 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 den for me. I started with a stack of business cards and a telephone. And after I get off work, say start his office, I'll make those calls and I'll knock on doors on the weekend. It took me two, three years to get my first contract. So you gotta be tenacious, you gotta block up the naysayers. Uh, another thing that's very important that I skipped over was paperwork. You gotta make sure your paperwork is in order. You gotta make sure that you are licensed. So whatever thing you go to, if it's a building a lawnmower business, go through all the city of Chicago ordinance to get your city of Chicago licenses. But if it's for me, I had to take tests to become a private detective, become a security agency and all this stuff. I did all that. From there, I went to the city and became MBE, DBE, which kind of made my pool of uh, competitors smaller now because I'm a certified minority business now I compete on contracts. And it authenticates me as a business that's been thoroughly vetted by a government AC saying this guy exists, he has a business, um, business cards, phone, knock on doors, got my first contract, did not have a website, did not have a bank. <laughs> you uh, uh, use my property that we got, took out second mortgages to finance the payroll so I was able to get paid. You know, so they start, so you know, as in a business, you have to do this. You have to be able to uh, work for 30 days, invoice, and wait for the money to start coming in. So we took loans out on our properties in order to pay to get those businesses, uh, get the payroll started. The people, people work. And um, uh, my first contract, I worked it, me and my brother. We was there on, on, on post working, uh, you know, every day. I said, this ain't going to work. I got to get some help, you know. But I did it. So you got to be willing to have grit. You are willing to be successful. My wife coined the term, not coined, but she always say to our staff, whatever it takes. Oh, yeah, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So whatever it took, I was willing to do it. So I was willing to die for what I believed in because I looked at my children, I looked at my spouse, and I said, this has to work. And being a spiritual man, because you know in the black community, we always spiritual, right? <laughs> I, I knew that if I pray hard enough and work, Couple with my education, why can't I be successful? Why can't I have what what my uh, my white counterparts have? Why can't I have a nice house? Why can't my kids have a have a uh, trust fund and things like that? So from there, first contract did really well. But we also have to mention on how to build. Yeah. Right, because at, at early in the business, John said, "I just can't figure this out. I don't know how I'm how I'm supposed to make money if <laughs> if." If I'm paying the the for the service, which was security, if I'm paying the guys 
$15 an hour, and it wasn't 15 back then, but if I'm paying the guys $10 an hour and I'm charging the client $10 an hour, uh, I, no don't, money. I don't know how I'm supposed to make money. And so again, going back to not having a blueprint in front of us, we realize that you need to add cost onto that payroll fee. And so the amount you give to the client is in excess, is a padded number that includes your payroll and other expenses taxes. Plus, your, plus your profit. And that's the number you give your client and you pay your employee that, that particular flat rate. And so we do, although when we first began, we didn't have a website or um, a bank, it is important that you do. So Very when important. you start your business concept, you after you get your paperwork, you definitely want to make sure that you have a business account and you definitely want to make sure that you have some type of virtual presence because depending on how big or how small you want to be will determine how valuable those things are. Now, your website can be developed over time, but you definitely need a virtual space so people it authenticates you as a business. I don't care if it's a lawnmower service, all businesses are honorable. All work So honorable. you need to make sure that there's some type of virtual presence so people can know who you are and where you are. Yep. Yeah, this is so important. Again, we live in this world of instant gratification. We expect everything, you know, not you know tomorrow, but in the next hour. What you're basically saying is that for three years you failed. You didn't have any business. Tell me, just ballpark honestly, how many doors did you knock on? How many calls did you make oh until you God. got a single customer? Uh, I would say at least at least 300 people. <laughs> 300 doors and, and, and getting told no, getting told you're not ready, getting told uh, why, should, why should I take a chance on you? You just you haven't done this before. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Arnie, that's why I say I started with grit. Yeah, so I want to break that down. Explain that grit because a lot of us we don't like to fail. We don't like people to say something. You know, we, we take it real personally. You know, we're we're not we're not that strong. Yeah. We get so, told three times we quit. You get told three hundred times and you make that three hundred and first call or knock the door exactly. and you get through. Explain grit and where you get it from and how did that sustain you through that tough time? Yeah. I think that grit is the uncanny ability to subsist through any type of circumstance. I, I knew that, mm -hmm. what was my motivator? Mm -hmm. My children and my spouse. Mm -hmm. You know, what did I want to create for myself? What kind of life I want to create for myself? Mm -hmm. If I'm tired of the street, if I'm tired of doing the drugs, if I'm tired of uh, uh, watching on my back, and I want to make a change, it takes grit. It takes you to have the discipline and the uncanny ability to accept because failure is feedback, Ernie. Mm -hmm. Failure is feedback. So Denise and I always say, Failure is feedback. I didn't understand that concept. You know, now I'm a 52 year old man, but 20 years ago, I was like, man, I'm just going to keep going. This has to work. And when you're persistent and consistent, something's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. So you got to have that grit. And if you don't have that, you're going to, you want instant gratification, you want to get rich. It doesn't happen overnight. Believe me, it's pain, secondly acquired. It's pain, secondly, it's, it's, it's steps, small steps. Small steps, but it counts. Small steps count. We talked to uh, Gardner, Chris Gardner, Pursuit of Happiness, and he told us, I said, what's the best advice you can give me? He said, small steps count too. Mm -hmm. He said, small steps count too. He said, move forward. And I said, wow. I mean, we've built our business. We go to seminars. I uh, talk to people, and I'd be like in awe. And as I began to build my business, I began to make sure that I'm accessible to people. So your population. Uh, I'm accessible if you need help. If you need to, uh, you know, I'm looking for a job and we can help you, we will. So that's how we did it, right? Yeah. Right. You go, so you go from that, three years, nothing, finally get a contract, you and your brother are working it. Today, you have 750 employees. So you're not just taking care of your family, you're not just building wealth, you are helping families everywhere stabilize, build wealth. Yes. What does that What does that feel like to provide that kind of opportunity for 750 families? You know, the best feeling in the world is to be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. And that's why I get up. I cannot tell you that um, 
they are not tough days. Because, you know, all my employees are W-2 wage earners. There's a lot of laws and bureaucracies and taxes and W-2s and the society is very litigious, as you may know. But Arnie, there's nothing more um, beautiful and more, um, more gratifying to me than know that I am changing the trajectory of my community. Yeah. And, it's, I, it's and I'm humbling. doing it. It's, it's very humbling. Mm -hmm. It's extremely humbling because um, we use a term around the office in, um, you know, protect the blessing. And so right. John and I have worked very hard and been committed to, to what we've been called to do. And so it's, it's an obligation. And so, you know, as we commit to continue to learn and get better, it's, it's our purpose. So we're definitely aligned in what we're supposed to do. So it's humbling to see it all unfold. Mm -hmm. it's and it's humbling. great. It's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing opportunity, but I want to be real. It's also pressure. Like you have these families livelihoods, you know, on the line and talk to, you know, I don't know, I don't need to know what your you know, monthly payroll is, your payroll every two weeks, but that's, it's a big, that's a big number, right? I, it's a big yeah. number. So yeah. what does it feel like to have that kind of responsibility every single day? Again, not just to your family, but to your employees and to their families and to make sure you can meet payroll um, every yeah. two weeks, every month. So I would, so we can just talk about that with recent experience <laughs> with COVID. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, with the COVID pandemic um, and all of the unknowns and unfamiliars floating around the entire country and everyone, our office, although we're essential employees, our headquarters was closed down. And so with the entire nation being closed, the way we get, the way we pay our employees is based on receiving payments from our clients. And with everybody working remotely, offices not opened, um, that process slowed down significantly. So in, this, in, in a business at this magnitude, you have a rhythm. You have a rhythm of accounts payables and a rhythm of accounts receivable. Well, COVID messed up the whole rhythm <laughs> and we had to readjust immediately. So there was a lot of strategies that we had to put in place to defer some of our accounts payable and to, for our bigger clients to ask for a net term agreement um, um, adjustment so that we can get paid quicker. And when that, since that rhythm was um, uh, disrupted, while many people were on social media talking about all this fun they were having with this free time at home, John and I had sleepless nights we had to come up with strategies just in case. I mean, when I say that payroll was almost not made by the hour, that's real. I, like that was real. Because you're going through cash and April. You're going through cash reserves. Oh because my gosh. That's why it's important to be bankable, have a bank relationship. Yes. You know, so uh, that that's very important. But you know, you, you, you get through it. You get we got through it very well. No one was laid off. We actually increased the number of hours because people everybody wanted they need security. I need security, you know, so we actually increased and was able to still uh, function. And yeah. We got through it, but I tell you, it was very difficult, but that's when that grit come in. That's where the grit comes You can't, in. you know, a grit come in. You know, you got to get through the bad days to get to the good days. And in the past, um, we had to tap into some of our personal savings to make payroll yeah. because mm -hmm. what you want to do as a business owner is pay your people and pay your taxes. Yeah, that's right. yeah. And so when when uh, years ago, when when payroll was short, yeah. when you maxed out your line of credit because your clients are paying really slow, um, we had to go know, to the pension accounts and take money out to keep the doors open. The but doors we never laid anyone off. Yep. Yeah. We always yeah. drew our business. Yeah. I just want to emphasize that to our audience. That's not what every business owner does. It's frankly not what many do. So the easier choice would be to cut people, to, to lay them off and not dip into your personal savings. So it's, again, that speaks so highly to, to your values, to your ethics, to the way you're living. Um, yeah. That's not the natural move that folks made. And you know, COVID's been tough for everybody. Other people made other choices. So I just wanna personally thank you for being willing yeah. to sacrifice some, some, some personal you know, wealth for the community. And that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, my last question, and I'll turn it over to Ali is, where do you guys want to be five years from now? What, what's your vision? Where, where do you want to be? Well, uh, the growth plan is cybersecurity. 
that's the good plan. We are all, actually the city of Chicago gave us the NOFO. Well, uh, the NOF. Never Opportunity Fund. Yeah, and then we, we got a grant to build a um, cyber, division. cyber division on the southwest side of Chicago next to our headquarters. Um, we want to be at all, we'll be national. We are already in 14 states or licensed in 14 states. Um, we want to have a cyber division. We can have close the gap with the, you know, uh, black people do not work in cyber as much as our counterparts. So can you imagine Inglewood, our progression, getting high paying jobs in cyber division provided by AGB on a global level? So why not? Why not? So that's what we want to be. So in five years, we want to uh, double revenue. We want to um, open, have a very sustainable cyber division providing jobs more training, you know, tell me about the Institute and the foundation. Yeah, so part of our, um, our, what we consider World AGB is our two nonprofits. One is the Always Giving Back Foundation, which is mission to disrupt the cycle of poverty through workforce development, philanthropy, and financial wellness. And then we have AGB Institute that is a mission to empower, inspire, and employ individuals between um, at the age of 18 and older right and so the point is to really access give them access to security not just as a job but as a career and so we really anticipate on growing and getting a, a broader footprint um, in government space to be able to receive those types of funding so we can grow our um, kind of spread a wider net and helping more people to become employed um, within security as, as a profession. We've been successful in having security identified as a demand occupation. So it's not just for AGB, it is uh, security as, you know, industry. as an industry. Yeah. So we're very, uh, very happy about that success. And so just really trying to grow um, the impact that we're making through the foundation and the institute. So we, we leave with service. That's what we leave with. That's our DNA. Yeah. Yeah. I'll turn to Ali. I'll just say personally, you know, it's an extraordinary story that, the, you know, the best years I think are still ahead, but it's, it's one thing to, to start a business. It's another to hire almost a thousand people. But that's really a whole nother thing to stay so rooted in the community and stay rooted in your values. And we all know lots of people who have made it big and sort of disappear and forget where they come from. And um, you guys have chosen every single day not to do that. And I want to say thank you and let you know how much it means in person. Thank, thank you, so much. sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank once you. Again, once again, I want to say, man, just watching you guys, I'm at all. Uh, because I'm seeing you guys finish each other's sentences. And, yeah, like it's a real, you're talking about a partnership uh, in home and out home, and it's like a perfect uh, storm. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect situation there. So I'm looking at it and I'm really looking, I'm thinking about me and my wife, like, oh, like what business can we put together? Right. And I will, I will hope some of our participants think about themselves and their, and their, uh, uh, significant other uh, in the same sense. Can you talk to us about how important it is to have a significant other that sees the uh, value in your dreams and actually, you know, paints the walls to the office uh, to help you move forward in your in your dreams and aspirations? So I, I <laughs> and thank you for that question because that's a real question that's, and. That's right. um, Right. There have been real experiences around that. Um, I always um, consider myself as an entrepreneur by default um, <laughs> because clearly it was my husband's dream to be this entrepreneur, uh, which is why we were kind of, um, I was working in education parallel to growing the business. But when my husband explained um, the concept of generating wealth for our families, and helping to make an impact in the community. That is the common denominator that really allowed us to be able to demonstrate our individual purposes in one context. And so John really is the visionary. Um, he really saw how big this could go. And I just helped to bring in my skill set that I've learned, my skill set that I was born with to help actualize the dream. And so I think it helps that um, he's a good friend. 
We enjoy each other's company because we live together, we work together, we drive in the office, talking on the phone. So um, it, is, it, it, <laughs> it wasn't that difficult to do, but it really helped for us to be able to see our individual gifts and bring it together um, in one context. And we enjoy it. Brother Ali, I like to say that my wife is the salt of uh, my earth in terms that she gives it flavor. When we, I started the business, it was my vision, yes. Oh, you're good. You, you're good. <laughs> you, you're good. Yeah, because, I'm going to use yeah. that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> you can use it. Use it. Use it. Yeah, yeah, you know. You know but it, it's the truth because when I started the business, she was right there. Like, she actually took AGB. Is I, I keep it. I bring it it's, it's a little box and she organized all my files she made sure that i had everything my insurance policy the contracts the invoices the payroll so she did that you know so when i first had the idea she was there yes i was out there i was one on the pole shaking it to get the money but my wife was the one saying yeah and when i came to a point the state attorney's office when i had to leave my wife said to me and i was and i was i had to leave i was either uh, going to be forced out or I had to make a decision about uh, leaving the state center office and uh, start or going full time in the business. She told me these words. She said, leave nothing for the swim back. She said, go for it. And you hear your woman telling you to go for it. And I was like, man, I, 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 got, I can't fail. I got to do this now. <laughs> then I came back and said, I got to take out 85 stacks out of the pension. She said, go ahead and do it. And do you want my car? You know, I had a minivan, she would trade in. Yeah. So I didn't forget that. So I didn't forget that. So she's she's been a she's been an excellent partner, Brother Ali, excellent partner. So man, that that's uh man. Okay. So we got man, that's that's a beautiful story, man. I I really I personally I can't wait till this thing clears up and I wanna see you guys in person. Uh, I'm getting so so many strong vibes from you guys. It's, it's really inspiring to me. We got a question from uh, one of our participants, Freddie. He's asking, how can he get involved in AGB? And, and also, let's add, AGB means always giving back. Yes. That's a, that's a hell of a name to even start out with. Like, yes. so much meaning in name. But uh, he said, he said uh, how can he get involved with always giving back? Right. So I am doing massive hiring right now. So I understand Arnie's population of people who probably got uh, criminal records. So here, listen to me clearly, Brother Ali. If a person has a record, they still can work security in unarmed capacity if it's been 10 years since adjudication. Mm -hmm. It can't be murder. It can't be, uh, you know, a pedophilia, you mess with kids. But other than that, drugs, uh, uh, I, had, I had a guy here that I'm not advocating as he's he's on um, robbery and he he works for me, but he got you gotta have a perk card. We also through the institute we do all the training for the uh, 20 40 hour training to become mm -hmm. security officers. We also uh, got a GD program that we are actually starting back up. We headed in our office in 95th Street in Beverly. Now we located 7545 Southwestern. So what we're doing is that we're a whole shop. I need a lot of black men, <laughs> but they have to be able to, to get through the background. It is okay to have a criminal record. Again, 10 years after adjudication, any misdemeanors will get you through. But 10 years after adjudication, if you have the will to learn, the will to be disciplined, the will to want to grow, there's money here. Brother Ali, let me say real close. Look, <laughs> there's money here, Brother Ali. There's money. There's money. You can grow, Brother Ali. You can grow. Here, we can grow. So what I'm saying to you is that I need, I can't hire fast enough. I can't hire fast, I need, so I'm blessed. And speaking of blessing, we interviewed with, with Craig and you guys didn't pick us. And I said, <laughs> wait a minute, I'm the best thing out and Craig didn't even pick us. You know? You know uh, that, that was, your internet went down. I didn't hear that last part. But we got, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but, uh, we, we, but we, we might have to revisit that. That's a, that's that's bigger than me, man. That wasn't me. I'm just saying it was it wasn't me. See, see, I read <laughs> I read I read Mr. Secretary's article. He said his article that people make twelve dollars, thirteen dollars, fifteen. 
No, I think it's $13. Okay. I have the article. He said this article, he said, if you made $13 an hour, you can change the life of a person from being on the street, being throwing bags or jabs, because you got 50 bags in a jab. Jab sale for what, I mean, you know, he said, you can make more money if you can change the life for $13 an hour. Well, I started with $14 an hour, all the way up to 25. Wow. So what I'm telling you is that I am the answer to Arnie Duncan's problem. Now, this but is Chicago. This is help Chicago me. problem. This Chicago problem. I think that's what you're saying. And, and the, the, ironically, we got a few guys that actually work security already. And I don't know if you know this, but in our in our 95th office in in, uh, in Rosen site, uh, YPC office, Youth Peace Center office, we have had uh, security training. They, so some of our guys have uh, certifications in, in security. Uh, We've had got, you know, people come through and certify them in the security training. Some of our guys actually had it per cars as well. So we right now, if you check the chat box, there's a couple of guys asking how can they get the number, how they get how they get in touch with you. So I know before yes. this is over we're gonna we're gonna have some kind of uh, you know, direct pipeline to Absolutely. AGB A A A A G B always give it back. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. We'll make sure uh, share that information with you because we do try to have um, two job fairs every month. That's right. And we have a every really, other Wednesday. Yeah, we have a really straightforward, systematic kind of onboarding process. Even due to COVID, we've been able to um, pitch that so that it's, it's virtual. So, um, and as we continue to um, procure more contracts, we're going to need more people. Yes. So, uh, so uh, Regina Bass, who's uh, one of our uh, top people over in the employment train, she said, please let them know we'll be in touch with them sooner than later. Great, so, cool. great, okay. great. Yep. Um, I want, there's some, some more questions. So I heard you, yeah, we have panel, we have guests come all the time, not often uh, do we get to ask this question or it kind of gets, gets left on the table. What were your relationships with? Well, you speak highly of your mother, but I, I didn't hear you say anything about your father. And both of you guys, how how were your relationship with your father? So so for me, my dad, John Griffin Sr., is my man. We real close today. He wasn't uh, he wasn't present as much because he had another family. At the age of 35, I forgave my father. And my father and I have been uh, very best friends from here on out. My dad even in his absence, taught me uh, what a father should look like, you know, and, and my dad is, um, is a very uh, uh, wise and respectful man. And um, I forgave my father because I know this dynamics, you know, in my mom divorced, I was five, he saw another family, he had, you know, things like that, you know, so I understood the dynamics and I understand it takes two people relationship to make things right. Um, so my dad is a good man and, and uh, I'm John Jr. So I would never disrespect my father, never put him down, but I was giving you the, the realness that he, he, he been present would have been phenomenal. Yes, yes, yes. But um, he did what he could, what he thought he could. And the rest was on me, you know? So, and my mom and my grandfather and my uncles was, was, was uh, in my early life. So with me, for my dad, um, my parents separated very early, um, but my dad was sick. My dad was a functioning alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And um, although he, he just, he was too sickly to be present mm -hmm. because he would go to work um, from sun up to sundown. And then after that, he would typically drink and fall asleep. So um, as, um, as, as I got older um, and he got better, uh, we do have a relationship. Um, it's like the roles shift um, because when you grow into yourself and with a certain level of maturity, you have the realization of their capacity right, right. or limited capacity they right. had when you were younger. So because we're older and I have three older sisters, you know, our role now is servicing our parents. That's so right. it is an honor to be able to 
support aging parents at this day and age. Yeah, yeah, same here, same here. So what's the, what are the ages of your children now? 28, 25, 20, and 19. 18. 18. The real is 18. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, they, they college, the, the last two is Spelman and Morehouse. First one graduated of Hampton University. Uh, the, the, the oldest daughter is uh, a child with special needs. Mm -hmm. And she went to a program at DePaul University where she finished. She's high functioning. She works for uh, university and she's she's beautiful she's beautiful is there is there any way that uh uh as this thing opened up or sooner than later we can get some of the participants to come through the facility that multi-million dollar facility you guys speak of <laughs> please 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 you know we were brother ali we were intentional we, we was in beverly for Seven years. No, no, about, about 12, 13 oh, okay. years. But when we, when, we, when we came looking for, we all grew that facility, we wanted to come to the, we wanted to come in the inner city, like further. We were in Beverly. We lived in Beverly. We was living in Beverly. I said, look, we didn't get into the inner city. Alvin Derrick Curtis of the 18th War was a friend of mine. He took me around. We found all these that was abandoned three or four years. We bought it. We gutted it out, made a state of art. But it's for the community. We encourage people to come in and take classes, whether it's concealed carry, whether it's cyber classes, whether it's training classes, whatever you know. I want you to come and know that you know we can produce a downtown look right on the south side of Chicago. That's right. When, when you say when you say uh, security, online security, is that IT work? And then what does that entail? What what does that entail? I don't know what you mean. I so because of um, COVID, we've moved, instead of having um, classes here in our multi-purpose room, we have classes online. Oh, yeah. And so it's kind of a hybrid uh, approach. So it's the unarmed training that is accessible online. And then the armed training is accessible online. And then you have to come in to get the second piece of that. And then we have the concealed carry training, which is also online. And yeah. in person, right. so it's a combination. Yeah. Um, of, of uh, okay, I thought you. I thought you were speaking about online, like keeping people from stealing documentation, IT to IT work. Oh no, no, no. So yeah. we do have a cyber division that we're building. I just mentioned that we're building on Seventy First, Ralph Western. We're building a SOC, a security okay. operations center. It's going to create eight to ten high-paying jobs. It's going to be network security and monitoring. So that that particular uh, industry, that particular um, sector is very high paying and we are gainfully employed in building that sector because that's my background it's secret service i did forensics for secret service and um computer forensics and that's what we're doing so that okay. that is happening so the training for that you will you guys be having training for that or does someone need to come already train and prepare for that or is it well, a it'll, it'll, both? it'll be a combination yeah. of both um, because the, the, the cyber division is committed to training and providing employment in that area. That's how we're able to, our intent is to bridge the, the technology gap that exists by underrepresented individuals. Right. And so we will have to hire skilled people because when the work comes in, you need people to be able to do the work. Right. But right. there will be, through our institute, there will be classes in order to get people or prospective um, employees trained for cyber. Right now, there are a lot of our city colleges of Chicago that are offering this type of training and they're looking for us to partner with them because we have the jobs. Well, we're gonna do the training ourselves yeah. um, and provide the jobs. So it, it's a possibility that we'll be able to send some of our guys through your training Oh my God! Yes, and and possibly get some of those high paying jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. That's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so we we're, we're approaching our time, and I don't want to keep you guys too long, but I do want to say once again, you guys are assembled, and uh, uh, I pray, you know I'll, I'll add you guys to my prayers just meeting you today because I, I see uh, I see assemble and I see passion there, and I hope that uh, AGB continues to grow and every all your endeavors do the same man so 
I'm going to turn it over to Arnie Duncan. I hope to see you guys in person in real life. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Nothing to add. Just an extraordinary hour. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your commitment. And it means the world just for us to get to know you guys a little better. So stay with it. Anything we can do to be helpful, we're all in. But it's remarkable. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, so Arnie. Thank all you. right, guys. Bye -bye, guys. Thanks.